It's a great time for us to be together right now because we're starting new community groups. We're starting a brand new series right now that, uh, that I think is uh, something that is living in me and I'm super passionate to share with you. I'll start with this. 15 years old, I'm sitting on a fallen tree with a fire in front of me. It's about 8.30 at night and it is dark all around us. I'm sitting there with friends from church, my peers, other 14, 15, 16, 17, 18-year-olds, and a handful of adult, adult leaders. We're outside of the city of Ensenada by about 20 miles. We had been there for three days. And when I say been there, been in the middle of nowhere at an orphanage with 30 to 35 little kids, played with them. I didn't speak any Spanish, but played with them, loved on them, plumbed one of their buildings so they could have running water inside. And around the fire that night, somebody had said, hey, let's end our night by just praying. Whoever wants to pray, let's pray. And people closed their eyes. And I don't know, there's something about a fire. I couldn't pray when I was closing my eyes, but I just opened my eyes to watch this fire. And just above the fire is the horizon, the hills right there. And as I was praying, I just, I can remember it like it was yesterday. And I said these words, it feels like Jesus could walk over the hill right now and he would join us because this is where Jesus would be. This is what he would be doing. And I was so struck by that. Like, I mean, I was 15 years old and the reason it was so, um, I think, transformational for me because it was the first time in my life that I think I contributed something to the family of God. See, when you're 15, <laughs> your world is all about you. Now, don't get me wrong. That was a significant moment when I was 15. I went back home and I was totally as selfish as I ever was before. But I just had that moment. Isn't it funny that I'm 47 years old now, but I can remember the prayer that I prayed when I was 15 years old. Because sometimes, you know what? God just shows up at times. And you have this significant moment in prayer with God, sometimes with a group of people. Other times, it's just been me and God by, by myself this last year. Sat in my office. I had more to do than I could even imagine getting done. Uh, there were some big decisions that needed to be made. I was kind of paralyzed in everything I was doing, and it just felt chaotic. And so I sat down, and uh, I opened my Bible, and I was reading John chapter 8. And in John chapter 8, I swear to you, I've never read these words before. I, didn't even, I don't even think they were in the Bible. I think God put them in the Bible a couple months ago. And it reads this way. Jesus, uh, to give you a little context, Jesus, there was some chaotic stuff going on in his world. And he made this statement to some of his followers. He said, the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Jesus, in his chaotic world, makes this statement. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. And I don't know if you've ever been by yourself with God praying and you read the Bible. And it's like, it's not that... It's not that you're just reading something significant. It's like God is speaking these words to you. And I heard for me, the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. I can't tell you the kind of encouragement and courage that that mustered in me. Have you ever experienced that? I mean, have you ever experienced in a group of people when you pray? That it's so significant, it becomes life-changing for you. Or when you by yourself, maybe you pray, it's just so significant for you. I had one of those in this room. My very first time ever coming up to Church on the Hill. I've been in Southern California my whole life. My wife, my one-year-old and my three-year-old at the time. My kids are now 17 and 19. And we had come up here and taken a look at this church. And the first time ever meeting, it was on a Tuesday night at prayer. And I tell this story a lot because, it, I mean, like it was yesterday, I can remember it. I was right back here. The pastor invited people to come up and just kind of pray around us. Didn't pull us up on stage, just like back there and prayed. <clears throat> the minute that I felt hands on my shoulder and I listened to people pray for me, Man, God turned the waterworks on in me. And I was like, <laughs> like, what is happening? I had not even realized what a parched environment I had been in for the last 10 years. For 10 years in serving a different church, not a single time had anybody come and said, how can I pray for you? And to have a group of people behind you. And it was in that moment that I felt God's love, concern, and encouragement through God's people. Massive moment for me. I hope you've had them. I mean, when you pray and you talk to God, either you and he by yourself or you with a group of people, I hope you've all experienced that. Because it makes me ask this question. Is there something that you and I can do to experience that more often? And it kind of leads to this question. If there is, are there things that you and I are doing that's actually hindering God from showing up and you and I connecting with him in a significant way? Now, <clears throat> I believe the answer to that 
is yes. There's things we can do to help that connection with God, and there's things that we can do to hinder that. And I'll tell you why I believe that in just a minute. If you want to, open up your Bibles. Go to Matthew chapter 6. And <clears throat> I will be, uh, let me be very clear with you. Make sure you don't misunderstand me. Because some of you might think, oh my gosh, when the pastor prays, Jesus shows up. I've had so many times of me and God, I open my Bible, I'm like, I get to the end of it, and I can honestly say that felt insignificant. I don't know if it was significant or not, I just felt insignificant. Like, I just checked my box, like, talk to God today, but it felt like a one-way conversation. I did a lot of talking. I don't even know if he was there listening. Theologically, I know God was with me, but it, I didn't feel like he was with me. I've had times when I've prayed in, in groups with people, I bet you have too, that felt flat insignificant, powerless. Last week, if you were here, I kind of shared that last couple months as we kind of gathered for prayer. If you're new to our church, we gather once a month on the first Wednesday of the month to pray together. And if I was going to be really honest with you, <clears throat> the last couple months, flat. <clears throat> I'm really struggling to connect with God as we gather together. And, and I, I say this, okay, if you come on Wednesday nights, I, I'm just going to tell you this, I'm not blaming you. It's not your fault. It's probably that knucklehead who's leading the prayer gathering. Okay, and if, if you show up every Wednesday night or every once a month on the Wednesday night and you're like, oh my gosh, it's the greatest time ever. What are you talking about? The last couple months have been great. God bless you. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying for me, I, they've been insignificant. There's something there that's, that's felt off. And so it makes me ask this question. Is there something that we can do when we gather corporately together that it's actually a significant time of connecting with God? And is there actually something that we're doing that's hindering our connection with God? And so let me run down a couple of these things. These are just my ideas, my thoughts as to what, when we pray in our times of prayer, what makes them actually insignificant or can actually hinder us from connecting with God. Here's just a, a couple of thoughts for you. One is this. No one taught us how to pray. You know how you learn how to pray? By praying and listening to other people pray. <clears throat> Question, who taught you how to pray? By the way, who taught them how to pray? And do they actually know how to pray? Or did you pick up all of their weird, strange habits, just assuming that because they were older and you were listening to how they pray, that you, you prayed with them? I might have shared this with you last week. Um, a lot of people pray this way. And uh, nothing wrong with it, but when that's your only two tools, I don't know, it's just not enough. Take away the words blessed and be with in people's prayers. What are you left with? Because have you ever asked, you listen to people's prayers? You know, you hear about Uncle Bob lost his job, so we're going to pray for Uncle Bob. Okay, God, would you, would you bless Uncle Bob? Yes, God, um, would you bless him? And uh, when you bless him, God, be with Uncle Bob. <laughs> like, we just, that's how we pray, because we're not sure how to pray or what to pray for. And so we're like, hey, God, bless and be with. And we want God to bless. We want God to be with. But is there anything else after that? Is there anything else other than that. And so I, I'm just kind of trying to put my finger in. By the way, I'm not shaming anybody on how you pray. I'm just asking the question. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a better way, and we'll get into that in just a minute. Um, <laughs> the truth is, is that sometimes when we get together, uh, the leader of the prayer gathering doesn't teach people how to pray. And whoever that guy is who leads our prayer gathering once a month, maybe he falls short occasionally on helping people pray in a way that's actually connecting with God. Um, do you know why most people don't go to a prayer gathering once a month? Because they've been to a prayer gathering. And it wasn't what they expected. It wasn't significant to them in a way that they really connected with God. And let me tell you how the leader will get it wrong sometimes. Um, we call it a prayer meeting, and maybe the, the leader at that prayer meeting mistook the, the prayer time for a teaching time. And he just talked and talked and talked and talked. And then we prayed for five minutes and the, the meeting was over. No, prayer times aren't meant for teaching. They're actually meant to connect with God as we pray. Uh, maybe the pastor turned the prayer time into one big commercial for all the programs at the church. Hey, we're going to Cuba. We're going to Mexico. Let's pray for those. Hey, we've got uh, community groups going on. Let's pray for those leaders. Hey, we've got this going on. And the prayer time just became a huge laundry list of all the programs for the church. And you walk out and you're like, is there something missing from this laundry list where we're actually connecting with God in a significant way? There's other moments where maybe in your personal world, you lead with requests. All right, God, here's what's going on in my world. 
would you, and then you just go through all the things that you need, and you are genuine, and you are sincere, and it's important to you, and maybe it's even important to God, but your prayers all revolve around you. And can I make it even worse? How many times do our prayers revolve around our safety, our comfort, and our ease? God, would you keep me uh, safe with? Or God, would you keep my kids safe with? And nothing wrong with that. I prayed one of those prayers significantly last Sunday. My daughter was driving from here to uh, Southern California, go back to college. In the middle, remember the rain last Sunday? Yeah, she's like, oh, I was on the freeway. I could hardly see the car in front of me. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. I mean, I got spiritual real quick. (laughs) But when that's all we pray is for our comfort, our ease, And for our safety, are we actually praying prayers that will change us? Listen to this. If if you if God answered your your prayers that you prayed for a whole week, He's like, whatever you ask for, I'm gonna give that to you. Would the world change at all? Or are we just praying for stuff for us? Or would you change it all? Or are you just praying for the comfort, ease, and, and safety? of those around you, and the world would change in an insignificant way, and you wouldn't change at all. I'm not blaming you. I'm just asking the question. Maybe what we're reaching for in prayer is not really it. One of the ways that our prayers can be uh, pretty insignificant is we fail to value the one we're praying with. (laughs) When I was a freshman in high school, I had my first real girlfriend. That's different than your second grade girlfriend, okay? This is real when you're a freshman. And uh, the problem with our relationship was she liked to talk on the phone. I was a freshman boy, and I don't like to talk on the phone, right? This is way before cell phones, okay? So I remember it was a summer day, and she was talking on the phone, and I was listening. And been swimming most of the day. I was a little tired. The sun was shining through. So I thought, I'm just going to lay here on my bed for a little bit as we talk. I don't know how long went by, but I woke up with this painful feeling in my ear with this tone of, the dial tone and the phone was pressed up against my ear and I was like oh and I was like how long had I been asleep question how valued did she feel (laughs) yeah that relationship didn't last long um by the way that whole uh issue that issue is 2,000 years old falling asleep in prayer um remember Jesus he grabbed his his SWAT team of disciples his top three best guys. And he said, hey, I want you to sit here and pray with me. And he goes, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to pray for a little bit. And Jesus is going to go to the cross shortly before that. And after that, these guys don't know it. He says, just pray. And he goes away. He comes back an hour and they're sleeping. And he's like, really? This is, you're going to sleep. How many of us, we've gotten together with God and like, okay, God, here we go. Let's pray pretty soon. Come on, you have to admit it, you've fallen asleep in prayer. If you've never fallen asleep in prayer, it's because you never pray, all right? (laughs) Maybe the reason our prayer is insignificant, number four, is that we just never knew that there was a right way to pray. Do you know there's a right way to pray? Jesus literally says this to his followers. He says, don't pray like this. I want you to pray like this. Did you know that there's a wrong way to pray? There is, and we're going to go over it in just a minute. The fifth thing that makes, that maybe, um, this is why our prayers are insignificant, is this. Instinctively, instinctively, we all know that something is missing when it comes to prayer. I think what's missing is this. It's our connection with God. I think sometimes we can pray out of duty, pray out of obedience, and that is great. But I think instinctive, we know this. There's something missing. I mean, when you talk to God, Maybe your big thing is, yeah, I'm going to drive to work because you drive an hour to work or an hour and a half to work. You're like, oh, hour and a half with God. I talked to him. Is that really the attention? Or is there something there that we just go, maybe there's something missing there? Have you ever gotten together to pray with people? And you're like, well, that wasn't significant. I didn't feel connected to God. Maybe there's something missing. And so if you feel like there's something missing, here it is. We're going to spend a month talking about how do you and I connect with God both privately and publicly together when we pray. And so let me just state our goal right up front. Here's our goal, the better way to pray. Our goal is this, ready? Our goal is to be equipped and inspired, which means this. We have to learn this together. If we're going to be equipped, it means there's got to be a better way, and if there's a better way, we got to learn it. Equipped and inspired to have a significant prayer times where we experience, here it is, this is what makes it significant, life-changing, it changes us, it doesn't leave us the same people, life-changing connection with God, both privately 
and corporately. I want you to learn how to do both. We'll talk about more of that in a minute. By learning how to pray, and here's the three things. I'll go over this in these four weeks, so you're not going to catch it all right now. I'm just going to intro this uh, this morning. Worship-based prayers. Prayer that's first about worship of God. Scripture-fueled prayers and spirit-led prayers. So this is the point of the series. This is what I want to help us do. If this is all you get this morning, I just want you to ask this question. Is there more to talking to God and being connected with Him than you're experiencing right now? If not, fantastic. Like, I'm so excited for you. But maybe there's actually more and you don't even know it. And if for the rest of you, like the 99.9 rest of us, if you're sensing, you know what, yeah, there is something missing. There could be something more. It's not to shame us where we're at right now, but it's to say, you know what, I do want to experience more of who God is. And if that's you, I'm going to ask you to dig in deeply into this series. I'll give you some action items at the end of this. But let's start with what Jesus says. There's a better way to pray. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Jesus, uh, he's teaching on prayer, and he literally says, don't pray like this, but I want you to pray like this. Verse 5, here's what he says to his followers. He says this, and when you pray, do not. Here's the negative. Don't do this. Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing on the, in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. Here's what he says. Don't pray like the hypocrites, because they're... Their motives are wrong. Their motives are wrong. They're concerned about their appearance instead of connecting with God. Now, truth be told this, probably nobody walked in today with that temptation to stand in front of other people and pray in a really pious way to make yourself look good. First of all, people don't like to pray in public because they're afraid they're going to do it wrong. Other people, you just don't like public speaking at all. You'd rather come in and remain anonymous. I mean, Very few of you probably walked in today and said, you know what, I'm going to try not to stand in front of others and pray. But here's what's interesting. We would call that arrogance, wouldn't we? But isn't insecurity just the opposite side of the same temptation? What I mean by that is this. For how many of us, if I said, hey, would you pray for us this morning? I handed you a mic and you're like, you want me to pray? This is like one of your greatest fears. And you grab that mic and you're like, and you start praying, but the only thing you're thinking about is what everybody else is thinking about you. Isn't it the same temptation in sin? That just says, I'm going to try to connect with God or pretend that I'm connecting with God, but really I'm just trying to perform for people so they won't think I'm unspiritual. Jesus says this, "Don't, don't do that. Don't try to talk to me and impress anybody who might be listening. And so, really, one of my goals this series is this, is that when we gather together, if you ever pray around your table with your family or with other people in a community group, or you join us at a prayer gathering, that you might actually be able to talk with God, to God, no matter who's listening. It's a sign of spiritual maturity in our lives. But he says, don't pray like that. Let me give you the other don't that Jesus says before we go to the, here's how to pray. In verse 7, he says, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, For they think that they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Um, First of all, it doesn't seem odd when he says, like, don't pray like the pagans do. Do pagans pray? I mean, it seems odd, like, well, isn't that a person who doesn't believe in God, and do they pray? No, no, here's what's interesting. Um, The book of 1 Kings in the Old Testament, Elijah, he has this kind of prayer battle with, like, these 400 prophets of Baal. Pagans are people, it's not just they don't believe in God, they have their false gods that they believe in. They don't actually believe in the God of the universe who created this world and sent his son into the world. These are people who have no obedience to him. But they have rituals, they have things that they say to get God to bless them. You know what happened in that story with Elijah and these prophets of Baal? These 400 prophets, they sing and they dance and they shout at God so that God might pay attention to them. Eventually they start cutting themselves to make blood come out to show God how serious they are so they can manipulate him to do what they want him to do. And Elijah's like, are you guys done yet? There's 400 of them. And then he, he prays and this magnificent thing happens. You'll have to go to 1 Kings chapter 18 to read it. But Elijah, because he has a relationship with God, God shows up and shows off in a significant way. He says this, don't babble like the pagans, meaning this, don't start reciting prayers to me thinking that you can make me do something. 
I played football in high school, and it was always weird before the game started. We'd get into the team meeting room, and guys had like game face on. Here we go. You know, way too much testosterone in that room. And then somebody, right before they'd go out, say, take a knee. They'd take a knee. And somebody would start, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I was like, this is the weirdest thing. I know these guys. They're total pagans. I mean, they're filthy-minded, bad-mouthed, evil. I mean, I know these guys. They're stopping before they go to play a football game to try and recite some kind of prayer that God might help them win the game so they can go out later that night and get totally wasted. That doesn't seem to be what prayers, I think that might be very close to what Jesus is talking about. Don't, don't babble some prayer to me. To, to make God do something for you if you have no intent of actually following him with your life. Jesus goes, he says, I'll say it like this. Do not pray like the pagans because their, their methods reveal that they don't know who God is. By the way, um, if you come from a background, uh, different denomination, Christian background, Catholic background, where you're encouraged to recite prayers, there's nothing wrong with reciting words from Scripture and praying the Lord's Prayer. Unless what you're actually trying to do is manipulate God to do what you want Him to do. If your relationship with God is absent from that, then it's babbling. Um, Jesus switches gears and he says this. He says, this is how you should pray. Look at verse 6. But when you pray, here's how to do it. Go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father. Underline that. To your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Some have said this because they've read it in different translation and it says prayer closet. Go into your closet. Okay. Uh, First century home in uh, Jesus' day probably had zero closets. It's a room, right? I don't think he's asking you to be totally anonymous about it. What he's asking you to do is do the opposite of standing in front of people and trying to be seen by them. Be private. The translation of that is actually go into a small place, a place with, it's actually more like few people than no one. And some people say, see, that's why I don't go to prayer gathering. It's supposed to be private. No one's supposed to know that I'm praying. Okay. Um, Look at the example of the early church after Jesus dies and then goes to heaven, ascends to heaven, and then the church launches because the resurrection is true. If you look at all of the prayers that were actually recorded there, look at how many were in groups of people, almost all of them. You rarely find one person praying a prayer by himself that is written down and recorded. Number three, pray to experience connection with God, which is actually the reward in prayer. What does he say? Pray to your Father. Do you have a sense of this? That when you're talking to God, that you're actually speaking with Him, and He's your heavenly Father. I know for some of you that's a hard concept because your connection with your dad has been so broken for so long, and I get that. And maybe you call him your heavenly parent. I don't know what term you need to use. But, or maybe he could actually, as a heavenly father, correct your interpretation of who a father could be. But do you know, is he your heavenly father? Because I think what Jesus is saying is that don't just pray a prayer and babble. It has to be spoken into relationship, into the relationship that you have with God. He says, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before Him. Here's what's interesting. Whatever you believe about God is revealed in your prayer. If you think you have to babble and babble and babble and babble and say all these things to coerce God, you know what that says you believe about Him? That He's stingy, that He's cheap, that He's distant, that He's probably not there and probably not listening if you have to manipulate Him. He's not a generous God. But Jesus says this, your Father... He already knows your needs. Really? I mean, he's that close. He's that involved. He's that generous. And so number four, I would just say it this way. Pray without requests. Now, you can't forget the next phrase because I'm not saying don't ask for anything. Here it is. Pray without requests dominating your prayers because you trust that your heavenly Father is in the know, available, and generous. Do you believe that about God? Maybe occasionally write down your prayers and ask this question. What does that prayer reveal about my belief in God? Do you believe that he loves you? Do you believe that he wants to connect with you? Do you believe that he wants to help you and empower you and change you 
and be in the midst of your family and be in the midst of your workplace. Do you believe that about him? If you do, then we don't have to, to twist God's arm in prayer. But I think our requests often dominate our prayers. So Jesus says this then. This then is how you should pray. Let me give you a model. And I'll just tell you this. You might say, oh, there's a lot of models of prayer in the Bible. I'm going to tell you no. I think there's one model. It's the model. Every other model falls way below this model because this model is given by God himself, Jesus God in the flesh, and he says this in verse 9. This then is how you should pray. And if God is going to say pray like this, we should pay attention to it, right? Some of you know these words. Jesus says, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed or holy be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. At verse 9 there, will you do me a favor? Write something down. Seek God's face. If you have pen, and you can write that in your paper Bible. Even if you open the Bible in the chair in front of you and you open that, you can write in that one. If you don't have a Bible at home, you can take that one home. We want you to have a Bible. But I want you to write, seek God's face right there. Because he's halfway through the prayer. He's halfway done. And all he's done is this, is our Father, who's in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom, what we want is your kingdom to come. And we want your will to be done. This is all about God. It's not even about the person praying yet. So he's seeking God's face, his relationship with him. He then keeps going. He says, give us today our daily bread. Would you write this? Seek God's hand in your Bible. Seek God's hand. He says, give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So he ends with these requests. And so his model is this, big picture model, we'll come back to this in the weeks to come, but in the big picture of this prayer, it's this, seek God's face first, and seek his hand second. Does that really describe how we pray? Let me put it in different terms. Um, We're going to call it worship-based prayer. Worship-based prayer, number five, seeks God's face because he's worthy. We don't seek God's face because we want something from him. We seek his face to know him because he's worthy. Then we seek God's hand because we're needy. We totally need him. Um, This book right here is called Transforming Prayer. It's written by a guy by the name of Daniel Henderson. He's been practicing worship-based prayer for like 30 years, teaching it to pastors and churches. I've been to his church. I've uh, I've been to his prayer gatherings. Um, He's a brother of one of our former pastors, Dennis Henderson, who also practiced this as well. Um, I'm going to tell you this, for some of you this morning, if you realize there's something missing, I want more, and you're willing to like, I'm going to dig into this thing. I really want to know. I really want to grow. By the way, I heard something last week when we were doing our contender series. Somebody came to me and said, you know what? I was talking to so-and-so, and and they were, they're like, yeah, I need to finally stand up and become a contender. And they're like, they responded out of, they did like three or four different things to say, I need, um, this year I'm going to grow. And I was like, man, that's super exciting. For some of you, say, you know what, there's something missing, I want to grow, I would highly recommend this book, Transforming Prayer, Daniel Henderson. I actually gave you a reference in your notes. Here's what he writes. Listen to this. Worship-based prayer seeks the face of God before the hand of God. God's face is the essence of who he is. We want to know who God is. God's hand is the blessing of what he does. God's face represents his person and presence. God's hand hand expresses his provision for needs in our lives. Here's what he writes then. His personal understanding of God, his personal experience of God. He writes, I have learned that if all we ever do is seek God's hand, we miss his face. But if we seek his face, he will be glad to open his hand and satisfy the deepest desires of our hearts. Do you believe that about God? He wants to know you, and he wants you to know him by seeking his, his face. The, um, the face, when you sit face to face with somebody, there's no hiding from them. It gets very personal really quick. It, if you're a couple, you know, together, dating, married, whatever, try it. I dare you. <laughs> try it this week. Sit about a foot away from each other. Don't blink. Okay, you can blink. But don't turn away. Don't roll your eyes. Be fully present and look at their face. Some have said that the eyes are the window to the soul. The face is a canvas for a person's life. 
when there is a relationship there and you look into someone's face, there is no hiding. And when we do it with God, there's no hiding from Him. Sometimes you want to pretend to be religious. Pretend like we've got this connection with God, but we don't want to take face time with God. Try it with your spouse. What words of affirmation would you speak? Tell them what you think about them. Tell them what you feel about them. Tell them what you appreciate about them. Thank them, and if necessary, give your apology to them face to face, just like that. I, I would recommend and suggest you do this before you get in a fight. But if you ever do get in a discussion, eventually get face to face. Because there is something intimate about looking into somebody's face. And Jesus' invitation is when you pray, come face to face with God. I, I get it, folks. I get it. We can't see God's face. So how do you actually have this worship-based prayer? I'm going to give you some suggestions on this. First of all, what does it mean to worship? Here it is. Worship-based prayer is our response to who God is and what he's done. One of the ways to get face-to-face -face with God is this. Ask this question, who is he? And how do you know that's who he is? And then question, what's he done for you? When the conversation begins, you can start with just, who is God and what has he done for you? God, you are, and let me give you some ways, suggestions to pray. I just wrote a couple there. God, I trust you because you are, and just tell God who you see him as. It's kind of the same way looking at your spouse, and you're like, you know what? This is what I appreciate about you. And you just say who they are to you. And you're like, oh, is it really that meaningful? Sit down and do that with your spouse face to face. Watch what happens. Let me give you another prayer. God, thank you for being, and God, thank you for doing. Man, to look into the eyes of someone that you care about and say, hey, thank you, because I recognize that you did this and it was for my benefit, and I'm so grateful. That'll change your relationship. Another prayer, God, because you are, mm, whatever, fill in that sentence, God, because you are faithful, because you are kind, because you are loving, because you are grace-filled, because you're merciful, I can or I will. Worship is our response to who God is and what he's done. I know worship, you hear the word worship, you're like, oh, I sing a song with God. It's such a limited version of worship. Worship is your response to all of who God is and all of it is that he's done for you. And so we thank him, we praise him, we acknowledge who he is, and we just say, because of that, God, I can trust you at work today. God, I can trust you with my marriage. God, I can walk into uh, my relationship with my kids, and I can help them know who you are. Well, however you'd fill that sentence, God, because you are this, I can or I will. So how else can we do this worship-based prayer? Let me give this to you, number seven, scripture-fueled prayer. If you're going to have worship-based prayer, you have to have scripture-fueled prayer because it allows God to start the conversation. Think about it this way. Um, you go to coffee with somebody. You get to wherever it is that you go, and you get your caffeine-filled cup, and you sit down together. And what if at that moment you looked at that person and said, listen, listen, here's what's going on in my world right now. At work, this is what's going on. I want you to know that. And in my uh, family, this is what's going on. And, you know, lately I've been feeling like this. And you go on for like 20 minutes and then take a breath. You started the conversation, you were the middle of the conversation, you were the end of the conversation. It was all about you. How does that person feel across from you? Some of you have had that kind of a coffee meeting, haven't you? And you're like, that was fun. But yet that's how we pray. If we're not talking, then clearly it's not prayer, right? A scripture-fueled prayer is actually this. It allows God to start the conversation. Let me tell you, Jesus said this in John, 4, John 15. He says, if you abide in me, we have a relationship, and my words abide in you, meaning the, the word of God lives inside of you, you will ask whatever you desire and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit so that you'll be my disciples. Where does all of that start? By having a relationship with Jesus and letting his word abide in you. Scripture-fueled prayer, let me say it this way. It changes the question from what will I talk to God about? This is number eight. What will I talk to God about? So what does God want to talk to me about? Let me be very, very practical. Here it is. Ready? When I pray, I open my Bible, and I let God start the conversation. God's spoken to us through his word, and so let him start the conversation. Hey, Scott, I want to talk to you about this. Actually, in your notes there, you'll see at the very end, I included um, 
five verses there, sometimes a whole chapter. Uh, most of them are in the book of Psalms. You know why I did that? Because Psalms is kind of a prayer book. By the way, there's some crazy prayers in the book of Psalms. You try and find them. Um, but there's a lot of prayers in there that start with this. God, you are, and if you read through any one of those psalms, you'll find a place where God can start the conversation about who he is to you. When I read that John 8, 29, the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. It's because I wanted to hear from God, and I asked him, invited him to speak, and then I looked at his words so that he might speak to me. What would it look like for God to start the conversation instead of us? Jesus, a little bit... Later on in this chapter in Matthew says this, here's what I want you to do, seek first the kingdom of God. And all these other things, these worries, the concerns, these things that you need, they'll be done for you as well. Let's just start there this week. Would you five times this week? Just let God start the conversation by reading one of those scriptures. And if some of you, you like writing prayers down or writing things down about what you read, like just write the significant things that are there and then start by responding without asking for anything, but respond with worship. It's your response to who God is and all that he's done for you. Um, Question for you. I guess my biggest point this morning is I really want you to just sense that there's something missing and maybe there's more for you in this prayer. And that maybe you in these four weeks would leap into a prayer challenge with God. Um, You know, it's interesting Boot camp challenges, uh, exercise challenges are totally trendy right now. They're happening all the time. Can I just give you a four-week prayer challenge to leap into this thing? Look at this picture. Um, That's not actually me at the top there, but I have stood on top of that very rock. It's called Gasoline Alley, and it's at Lake Mojave, and it's a pretty infamous spot for boaters and thrill-seekers. I was there in a boat with a bunch of high school kids, and I just said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to climb that rock, and we're going to jump off it. Now, if you've ever sent your, parent, your parents, if you've ever sent your kids with us to camp, um, this is what we do. Um, <laughs> just kidding, kind of. Um, I said this, you don't need to jump from the top. In fact, none of you can jump from the top. I jumped from the top. It was awesome. But don't, because I didn't want to rescue anybody from the water. Like, it's super dangerous. 65 feet, give or take 15 feet, right? I mean, it's way up there. But I said, here's what you're going to do. There's so many different levels for you to jump off from. Climb up there to where you feel comfortable. And then do this. Climb up five more feet. Because how boring is that for you to jump off of something that you feel totally comfortable doing? That's lame. Go to where you feel comfortable. Climb up five more feet, and then here's what you do. Jump off. You know who remembers this? You know who still tells stories of this? People who got out of their comfort zone and jumped. Here's my invite to you. In these four weeks, would you take a look at what feels comfortable for you in prayer? And then climb up a couple other levels and start praying that way? Maybe it's worship-based prayer. Try it. Don't ask God for anything. Try it for one day. Don't ask him for anything. Just respond to who he is and what he's done for you. Use these scriptures. For for some of you, um, to pray five times in one week like that is five more times than you've done all year. Awesome, fantastic. I'm not asking you to spend two hours alone with God praying. That would be like climbing to the top of that hill and jumping off. It's way more than you've ever done. If you prayed five minutes a day and you're used to that and you're comfortable with that, 10 minutes a day, would you read those scriptures and just do worship-based prayer and start with that? Because here's what I know. I think something's missing, and it's our connection with God. And I want to help us walk into that boldly and powerfully. Um, So let's end with this real quick. I'm out of time. How many of you, you're willing to admit this morning by a raise of hands, my conversation with God, there is something missing to it, or there could be something more. Just raise your hand. Oh, good. Good. Because if there were no hands up, we're done with the series. (laughs) It's just really for me. Um, How many of you, you're actually willing to, if you raise your hand, you're actually willing, I'm going to do something that is different and I'm going to take another couple steps up out of my comfort zone. I'm willing to do something. Okay, good. Is there anybody who's like, you know what, I really want to dig deep and I'm actually, you know that book that you were holding? I was actually on Amazon already and I was about to order it. Like, is there anybody, you would actually be willing to read a book 
that says, I want to grow in this. Is there anybody? Really? Really? That many? All right. Okay. Then we'll do this. Jacob, I saw your hand, buddy. You come see me afterwards, and this one's yours. And I know for some of you, you would read it if it was free. Go order it, and you'll find a lot of things that I have written, I've read or talked about today. And, um, and you're going to find a great wealth in here that could very likely change your whole connection with God and your perception of who He is and how you connect with Him. Dig in. Climb up a little higher than you're comfortable and take a leap off. Yeah? Stand. Let's pray. I know that at this point in the service, and I pray, it's super tempting to pray and worry about what people are thinking of me. Apparently, that's not how Jesus wants me to pray. So how about I talk to God, and how about you talk to God, and let's talk to Him all at the same time. Can we do that? This isn't the pastor's prayer. This is our prayer. Whatever it is you want to respond to God this morning, do that. God, in this moment, I'm just um, so grateful for who you are and how you love us. I'm so grateful for your son. I'm so grateful that he didn't just leave us on our own to figure out this whole prayer thing, but God, you taught us to pray. And so God, help us to not arrogantly think that we've got it down already, but God, you're inviting us to be humble and to actually learn something new, assuming we don't know it all already. And so God, that's what we want to walk into. And Father, I would just ask for a blessing for these people here right now, that as we leap into this series, that you're going to do something significant. I know how faithful you are, so I trust you to show up in a great way. If you want that, would you simply say amen?